Well, this is a, a vast subject of great concern to a lot of people and uh, different groups of people as well. And this is a, a problem that goes back 4,000 years uh, to the founding of the Empire of Babylon, and it has to do with empire building. And this mentality for empire building uh, has to do with building a uh, empire that controls the material things uh, in the material world. And the people that are involved in this uh, have defined their terms like rule, power, authority, and things like this. So in ancient times, if an um, army like the Mongols came in and destroyed uh, Baghdad and the Islamic dynasties that were set up, they would then conquer them and then set up the uh, Mongol empire. And they would rule by force and make, might make, makes right and it's a human behavior pattern that follows the struggle for existence uh, like animals uh, have uh, in the animal kingdom. <clears throat> People think of power in the animal kingdom, well, they think of uh, the predatorial animals like the lion uh, that they say is the king of the jungle because it has enough power to tear apart and eat up uh, some of the other animals uh, in this way. Well, the uh, other animals uh, are also uh, confined to their experience of what they can think about or desire through their senses. The eyes, ears, nose, mouth, arms and legs, uh, tasting, touching, smelling. And they want to have and acquire uh, a space where they can enjoy the material pleasures of their life. So they're able to get in control of land and control goods and services, uh, make laws about what is legal or illegal. And they do this in a kind of a rigged system to benefit themselves personally. So by uh, power and control and authority, uh, this has to do with them feeding the, their insatiable insistent self. And the more uh, <clears throat> uh, ambition that the individuals have or the group has or the country has to acquire material possessions and have the control over them, they think that this is uh, power. Well, this is not really power. Everybody here who's a human being that lives, uh, their body will eventually become disintegrated. And within 200 years, none of us will be on the planet anymore at all. Everything in this world is made out of uh, atoms, uh, minerals. Uh, it's the building blocks of everything that we can see in the world of creation that we're exposed to. And these are all subject to being ultimately disintegrated and rearranged. So everything here in this world is completely transient and in a constant state of motion and in a constant state of flux and transformation. Things are either coming into existence uh, and uh, growing and evolving and creating uh, different structures that are more complex or they're going out of existence and are in a state of disintegration and uh, eventually decomposition. We see this with the life of a plant. Uh, they find ancient seeds hermetically sealed in Egypt and they're 5,000 years old or 4,000 years old and they're able to take them out today and plant them. And as soon as they add water and sunshine, uh, the seed uh, sacrifices itself and becomes the plant and growth is initiated. And then later at a certain time in the plant's life, uh, the life force starts to fade and the plant reaches its uh, life cycle and begins to disintegrate. And then eventually it's consumed and pulled apart. So power, real power, is the power of the spiritual reality and the operating reality that's operating uh, behind the scenes that is in control or a guide or a parameter by which the patterns that we see in front of us take place. Well, human beings created this uh, game uh, when they hijacked civilization from the divine educators and removed themselves from the spirit foundation. 
So what they're doing is they're defining rule, power, and authority, or power, in strictly a materialistic mindset. And this isn't actually real power. The people thought that they had power when they were able to uh, crucify Jesus. They thought they had power when they were able to run Muhammad out of town. And they thought they had power when they raised up armies to try to defeat the prophet and the believers in his day. And this is not what real power is. In fact, when the prophet Muhammad uh, revealed the victory surah in the Quran, after having had many battles where they were materially victorious, he revealed the, vic the victory surah in the Quran when the Treaty of Hudabai was signed in 628 AD. And all of the believers and the community at that time uh, questioned him. They said, why are you revealing a victory surah when we haven't had a glorious battle, we haven't captured any territory, but we're making a peace treaty with those who uh, controlled Mecca? And this is because real power is the power of human beings being able to cooperate together and being free of prejudice and where the individual human beings themselves do not have a materialistic, a solely materialistic outlook on things. So this question about uh, power is uh, answered very easily that the Sands Guardian Baha'is, like many Jews, Muslims, and Christians, that have a materialistic outlook are looking to set up some sort of organization or structure by which they can control the material affairs of the people. And this is as far as their outlook goes. But God is already in control of all the material affairs of the human beings, uh, both in the creation of the physical universe and our bodies, and God is in control of the spiritual reality of human beings which is the soul and the intellect and our spirit that we have a latent uh, inside of us that's invisible. So real power is the power of the true educator that's able to educate human beings out of the animal condition so that they can become real human beings and have the spirit. So I'm going to read a few quotes from the guardian of the Baha'i faith, Shoghi Effendi that shows that the people who are in this other mindset of just materially expanding and having ambition to have people sign cards or convert, so to speak, uh, to their religious group, whether it's Sunni or Shiite or Jews or Christians or Catholics and Protestants or Baha'i or some other group is all outwardly uh, irrelevant. What's significant is the transformation of the individual human being into understanding and experiencing their true inner spiritual reality. So this is uh, what Baha'u'llah uh, has revealed uh, in the oneness of humanity is that we should all be able to become uh, spiritualized. This is from Abdul Baha. And he says, O ye loved ones of God, in this the Baha'i dispensation, God's cause is spirit unalloyed. His cause belongeth not to the material world. It cometh neither for strife nor war, nor for acts of mischief or shame. It is neither for quarreling with other faiths, nor for conflicts with the nations. Its only army is the love of God. Its only joy, the clear wine of his knowledge. Its only battle, the expounding of the truth. Its one crusade, is against the insistent self, the evil promptings of the human heart. Its victory is to submit and yield, and to be selfless is its everlasting glory. And Shoghi Effendi clears this up about what this one crusade against the insistent self uh, means. He says this, not by force of numbers, nor not by mere exposition of a set of laws and noble principles, not by an organized campaign of teaching, no matter how worldwide and elaborate in its character, not even by the staunchness of our faith or the exaltation of our enthusiasm, can we ultimately hope to vindicate in the eyes of a critical and skeptical age, the supreme claim of the Abha revelation. One thing and only one thing, Shoghi Effendi writes, will unfailingly and alone secure the undoubted triumph of the sacred cause, 
namely the extent to which our own inner life and private character mirror forth in their manifold aspects the splendor of these eternal principles proclaimed by Baha'u'llah. And again, uh, he states, the friends must realize the power of the Holy Spirit, which is manifest in quickening them at this time through the appearance of Baha'u'llah. There is no force of heaven or earth which can affect them if they place themselves wholly under the influence of the Holy Spirit and under its guidance. Such individuals who are subject to the negative influences of the world are those who are not properly consecrated uh, in the faith. And he says, there are three processes in teaching. The first is to attract the people, the second to convert the people, and the third is to be consecrated. There must be attraction, conversion, and consecration. The teachers must not be unwise. All right, so materialists uh, misinterpret the, these words about attraction, um, conversion, and consecration. What this is referring to is that the direction that the Baha'i faith is going in uh, at the present time, as it has been for the last century, but more uh, with conscious awareness, is the crusade against our own insistent self. In Islam, uh, in some of the uh, groups, this is referred to as the greater jihad, which is the triumph over nafsamara or the insistent self. The insistent self is the self that defines power and greed and self-aggrandizement as the material control and manipulation of things for the, for the power, manipulation and control over other people and having influence uh, to control their thoughts or their minds or their behaviors or influence their ideas. So what we're talking about is not the whole world converting to the Baha'i faith, quote unquote, and signing cards or becoming part of an objective obedience to uh, a certain Baha'i or, or group of people that claims that they're being Baha'i. What a Baha'i person actually is, is a person who is firm in the covenant and through that knowledge is able to uh, be assisted by God in overcoming their insistent self. And that's the conversion. The conversion is to be converted to understanding that we're here on earth in the material world and in our human relationships in the human world with other people to become uh, created in the spiritual and everlasting image and likeness of God. And these are the spiritual qualities and attributes of God, love, justice, mercy, concord, fidelity, harmony. So the person uh, has to be able to overcome their insistent self and be uh, dedicated to service uh, for humanity in the name of God, because this is the growth oriented direction of our true or spiritual inner personality. When a person starts to perform this by teaching the true spiritual reality of the Baha'i faith to themselves, where God has become their own first teacher in their own understanding of this, that then they become uh, consecrated and uh, converted uh, to this. When they become fully dedicated to it, they're consecrated to it. It begins with an attraction, not to joining another group or converting to another religion or organization, but an, an attraction from the self of the person uh, to the one true invisible God, an attraction the way the lover, the soul, is attracted to the beloved, the creator of the universe and everything in it. Then they become uh, converted to a new understanding of the spiritual reality, which is the source of true power and knowledge and authority and love and justice and the qualities ad infinitum of and attributes of God. That's what it means to be attracted to God, converted to, to the spirit, and then consecrated to such an extent that a person would never seek any personal gain or ulterior motives or, or uh, 
self-empowerment or self-aggrandizement from any of the things of the world, things of this world of Nasut or the human realm. They're completely severed and detached from this. That's what a Baha'i is. So this is why Abdul Baha states that it doesn't matter if a person's never heard the word Baha'i. If they've been attracted to the God, the one true invisible God in the spirit, they've been converted to no longer behaving like an animal and to be, no longer be attracted through their insistent self to greed and the material things and power of the animal mentality that's in the empire building we were mentioning, then they are uh, converted uh, in this way and then they become consecrated in God. It doesn't matter if the person self-identifies as a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Hindu, we would consider that person who is consecrated in God and shows forth all the qualities and attributes of God to what we would mean to be a Baha'i. In other words, if we had a bunch of lamps and some of the lamps were Jewish and some of the lamps were Muslim and some of the lamps were Christian and some of the lamps were Baha'i and the other faiths, et cetera, and they were all off, well, then none of them are on. And what we mean by Baha'i is a lamp whose lit, lit, light is lit and who is on. If out of all the Jewish lamps, three of them were on, and out of the 10 or 20 Christian lamps, two or three of them were on, and out of the hundreds of Muslims or lamps, 30 of them were on, and out of the millions of Baha'i lamps, one was on, well, then we'd have uh, one Baha'i and the, all the other ones that were on would also be considered Baha'i from our point of view. So the prophecy in the Baha'i faith, when it says the whole world will become Baha'i, does not mean that the whole world is going to convert uh, from a material religion uh, that they're a member of outwardly and then join a different congregation and now call themselves Baha'is or something like this. This is completely wrong thinking, and it's the same mentality that's in the uh, Naf Samara, the insistent self, and the empire building. To be a Baha'i means to overcome the insistent self, and not to just declare things in words, but to be a Baha'i means to be the embodiment of that luminosity of the light bulb that's on, and to be shining for the individual, for their soul to be like the sun, their mind like the rays of the sun, and their own body the mirror of their soul, in which case the light and heat of their own mind from the sun of their soul can shine through into the darkness of this world and make it a spiritual and heavenly paradise. And this can only happen when the soul turns to God and the fire of the spirit of faith is kindled within the soul so that it is able to shine with this bright light of the mind uh, forward uh, toward uh, the rest of uh, humanity. And the power behind this is the love of God. So the Baha'is uh, and this cause has nothing to do with material things at all. So the people who are concerned that the, that the actual real Baha'is want to take over the material control of their governments and things like this, uh, this is completely false and wrong thinking. And the covenant breaking Baha'is that have come out from the divine guidance that have fallen into the error of the other people's mentality and the other religions where they want to have a material government and take over a material country is completely wrong thinking and actually forbidden uh, in the sacred texts of the Baha'i faith. We already have government. We've talked about this before in these interviews. Every town in the country I live in has a local government. The state I live in has a state government. Then we have the federal government. In Iran, it's the same thing. We've got the state government in Tehran, and we have local government in Tehran, and then we have local government in all the other towns and, of course, the different provinces. Baha'u'llah is explicit in the book of uh, the Kitab Yad, the book of the Baha'i Covenant, uh, the Kitab Yad and the Sacred Will and Testament of Abdul Baha together form one book, and that's the sacred document for Baha'is. The way the Muslims have the Quran, the Jews have the Tanakh, and the Christians have the Bible, the Baha'is have the Kitab Yad and the Sacred Will and Testament. This is the central holy book of the Baha'i faith. 
And in the Kitabiyad, Baha'u'llah says the governments of the earth are vouchsafed unto the people who are the leaders of those governments. And he says, but the hearts of the people belong unto God. So the conquest of the Baha'i faith is to attract the hearts of the people to God. And this happens when other people meet an actual Baha'i. And this is a real Baha'i. And by a real Baha'i, I mean, not only is their light bulb on, like we see with uh, what we would consider to be Baha'is of uh, um, whether they self-identify as Jews, Christians, or Muslims, but we're talking about a person whose light bulb is on, who's firm in the covenant, so to speak, their light bulb's on, so to speak, and who self-identifies as a Baha'i, and whose intellect and mind is knowledgeable about the truth of what the cause of God really is. And this is why it says that, that we promote the cause of God. And the guardian is called the guardian of the cause of God in the will and testament. He's not called the guardian of the Baha'i faith. In other words, the cause of God includes Jesus and his work, his revelation, and the teachings that, uh, that uh, caused the people to become spiritual. And the cause of God includes Moses and Muhammad and Krishna and Zoroaster and Buddha, et cetera, et cetera, including the Bab and Baha'u'llah. So the cause of God that the people are attracted to, converted to, and consecrated in is where the individual soul stands before its creator, independent of all save God, and is able to say, oh, Lord, not my will, but thine, which is the surrender of Jesus, and say, oh, God, you know, create me, recreate me in thy image. It says, let us make man after our image and after our likeness. So the Baha'i government is a spiritual government. It's not a material government. It's a government that governs an education in a school. And the education is so that the people can have the veils removed from themselves so that they can come right directly before God and enjoy the reunion of the lover and the beloved. And this is why Shoghi Effendi has stated uh, in this one section that we read where he's talking about uh, the plans that the people have is that uh, he states that not by an organized campaign of teaching, no matter how worldwide and elaborate its character, which is what the Sands Guardians are doing uh, in, in building their community, uh, will bring about the ultimate victory. The one thing and the only one thing that will unfailingly and alone secure the undoubted triumph of the sacred cause, not the triumph of the Baha'i faith, but the triumph of the sacred cause of God, which is where God is purposed to cre recreate man in the spiritual and everlasting likeness of God, to make people real human beings, he states, is the extent to which our own inner life and private character mirror forth in their manifold aspects the splendor of these eternal principles. In other words, it's the overcoming of the insistent self. So, this is the true perspective of the Baha'i faith. Now in the world today, there's no international government. There's national governments at the federal and state level, and then there's local government, but there's no government that forms a union between the nations. So when the nations have a problem, they have nowhere to settle their differences. And if they're performing shenanigans, <laughs> and have uh, um, uh, this insistent national self pride to want to invade or conquer their neighbors or uh, make economic war or be uncooperative in the international community, this becomes a difficult problem. And uh, this is where Baha'u'llah's revelation gives humankind a, a great gift, which is a mechanism by which the nation states can form an international council to settle their differences upon. When he first gave the revelation and they rejected the religion of, of the spiritual depth of what this is about, which when a person conquers their insistent self inside themselves, which is the greater jihad, they attain a condition and a station in the presence of God, which we would call the most great peace. 
most great peace is that the soul is now at rest and at peace with God inside themselves and in their community with other people who have also attained unto the most great peace. They also form a civilization externally, which we would call the lesser jihad or the lesser peace, meaning it's the material peace. The material outer peace is lesser than the spiritual inner most great peace that a person uh, would experience. We can only have a peaceful society if there's peaceful people. So then Baha'u'llah said that since they rejected the most great peace of the direct knowledge of this revelation that he's given, he offered the nations and peoples of the world the what he called the lesser peace in which they would be able to elect a tribunal of the nations and settle their differences there. And he's very successful. Baha'u'llah declared the equality of men and women. He uh, declared the abolition of slavery. He declared the abolition of war. Conflict and strife are absolutely forbidden, a rigid prohibition in the book. And he called for the election of an international union or council of the nations or supreme tribunal. And what we see is after he announced this, the Tsar of Russia, Alexander, and Abraham Lincoln, uh, when Bala announced the abolition of slavery, they abolished slaves and serfs. It became a reality. For the first time in 6,000 years, it became a reality. And this is amazing. Uh, he announced the equality of men and women. And now we see the suffragette movement happen in, all around the world in the early turn of the century of the 20th century and just about everywhere on the planet, women have the right to vote and have this equality in the majority of the countries now. And he announced the abolition of war. And in 1928, all the nations of the world, starting with about 64 of them, entered into the International Covenant of Peace, the Kellogg-Briand Peace Pact that was put together in Paris. So war is illegal uh, on the national level and all the nations that subscribed to this agreed they would not use this type of mentality no longer uh, in their uh, policy of government of the nations or their uh, um, international policy with their neighbors. In order to implement these things, they needed to elect a, an international council. And this was imitated three times. Wow, Baha'u'llah announced it and the, the people have imitated it uh, thrice with the World Court, the League of Nations, and the United Nations. But they never form these international um, bodies according to the correct principles that Baha'u'llah has enunciated. So they failed. The World Court failed. We had World War I. The League of Nations failed. We had World War II. And the United Nations were watching it failing right now. And we're on the brink of uh, what they're calling World War III if new thermonuclear weapons are eventually used uh, in the scenario that they're anticipating. Uh, that would be a one hour of thermonuclear war in which one third of mankind was killed in that one hour and every American city of 100,000 or more is targeted. This is the precipice that we're on now. The Baha'is were entered into a Baha'i covenant with Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha to continue the true work of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. And this work has nothing to do with converting people uh, from this other materialistic mentality to being Baha'is or signing cards. In fact, during Baha'u'llah's ministry, uh, while he was a captive in the Ottoman Empire uh, in the prison of Akka, he forbid his uh, people at that time to teach the Baha'i faith in the Ottoman Empire to convert the people. And when the state of Israel was shut, set up, Shoghi Effendi continued this, that the Baha'is were not to teach the people in the area of Palestine and Syria and Israel the, the proofs and evidences or what the interior uh, uh, view is of what the Baha'i faith actually is in its reality so, so that they would find out what this was. So the Baha'is uh, at the leadership level have never been intent on mass converting people to be blind followers or just part of the Baha'i group. When Abdul Baha lived in the Holy Land, he also went to mosque on Friday and he kept his Baha'i work private to himself. 
as far as the uh, education to the proofs and evidences and the reality that of what the Baha'i revelation is. But that didn't stop him from performing the Baha'i work that the Baha'is are supposed to do. He was able to uh, buy farm equipment and plant uh, gardens and, and, and crops for the people to survive and not starve when the war broke out, World War I. Uh, he hired a physician in secret so nobody would know it was him to be a free clinic for all the people uh, in the area where he lived because they didn't have health and human services by supported by the government at that time. He collected up uh, clothing and used clothes uh, like donations. And he would then distribute winter coats to the people. And he served the people the way we would hope the true government would. And this is what we mean by a Baha'i government. A Baha'i government is, is kind of a misnomer. What, because in the kitab Yad, he states the governments of the earth are vouchsafed unto the rulers, but their hearts, which includes the hearts of the rulers, belongs to God. If the rulers who are the leadership people that are elected by the people in their local and national governments have their hearts belonging to God, that's a Baha'i government. It doesn't matter if they're stated to be a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim. If their heart has been attracted to the one true invisible God through Jesus, Muhammad, or Moses, or and uh, converted to being absolutely enthralled and in love with the one true invisible God through Jesus or Moses or Muhammad, and they're consecrated to the one true invisible God through Moses, Muhammad, and Christ, we consider this person to be a Baha'i. And if they consider themselves to be a, 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 a spiritual Christian or Jewish or Muslim, that's the religion of origin from the original manifestations that God sent them in the cause uh, many years ago or centuries ago.